Hi, guys. I'm going to start with a very embarrassing part of the talk, and I promise it's going to get better afterwards. Um, this is me when I was 10 years old, dressed as a surgeon. I promise I didn't dress up that way throughout my whole childhood. And I really hope my sense of fashion has improved since then. However, ever since I was a kid, I wanted to be a doctor. I think I watched too many episodes of House MD. I don't know how many of you are familiar with that series. Please don't make me feel very old. Thank you. I was intrigued by the process where a patient would come and he would identify what is the condition, what is the disease that causes this condition. That was the most interesting part of it. When I was 16, my father, who was working in surgery, well, actually still working in surgery, offered me for the first time to watch a real-time operation. It wasn't a very fancy operation based on the medics, it was just an appendicite. At that moment, I realized I'm not going to be a doctor. <laughs> but I still really enjoyed watching medical movies, reading books, and speaking to medics. And this is what led me to the field of medical diagnostics. Later on, I still really, really wanted to have the doctor title, so I went and I did my PhD at Imperial College London, but a few other reasons as well. Sorry, my supervisor. Um, so what is medical diagnostics? And why is it so important? Because without diagnostics, medicine is blind. And more specifically, medical diagnostic is the process where we identify the source of the con or the condition of the illness, which disease causes that. To be able to do that, medics or lab technicians, they need special tools. These tools are called medical diagnostic tests. When we think about Dr. House again, and we think about his department, he works in this super cool hospital in New Jersey, right? And he has a whole staff of medics working for him, operating these really nice, clean laboratories with really fancy machines in which they use to test the actual human specimens. The specimen can vary between a simple blood test or an actual whole body scanning. What I'm personally interested in is something a little bit different. My personal passion is to be able to do similar analysis but without these fancy machines and without these super equipped um, laboratories and without this really, really well-trained personnel. What I'm personally passionate about is to be able to take this specific analysis or different tests and to be able to do them anywhere, whether it's going to be in your house or under a banana tree, like you can see here in a very remote village in Uganda. I will try to explain why in this year, in 2019, this process is really important and why building tests that we call them point of care tests in the professional matter is really still important. And I will try to demonstrate that with a very short story. So it's a story about a little boy whose name is Emil. He was born in a small little village in Guinea, next to the border of Liberia and Sierra Leone. When he was two years old, he got sick one day. He had very, very high fever. Um, heavy diarrhea and vomiting. Two days later, this little boy passed away. Within a week, his mother, his sister, and his grandmother also passed away. It took another month and a half to identify the source of this mysterious illness. And only three months later, in March 23, 2014, the international and the local health authorities could actually announce that there was the beginning of the biggest Ebola outbreak in West Africa. And I'm asking myself, how can that be that over a course of a whole week, a whole family goes away and not even a single medical personnel sees them? How come it takes another month and a half to identify the source of such big disease with another 30 casualties? And I hope this will demonstrate this situation. So when we're looking at the distance from bet between Emil's um, village and the nearest hospital, there is over 230 kilometers. If we're comparing it on the Guinea scale versus Germany scale in Guinea with the condition of the roads, lack of transport, it can take between five hours and almost two days to get to this hospital. If we're looking in Germany with really good highways, it can take up to three hours. When we're looking on the amount of hospital in Guinea, over a population of 12 million people, you have a total of 44 hospitals. It's quite little, right? In Germany, over a population of 83 million people, you have over 2,000 hospitals. And the most shocking bit is the ratio between one doctor to patient. In Guinea, each, pa each doctor is responsible for around 10,000 patients. 
right? In Germany, it goes to 211, and still there is always report shortage in doctors and how we need to get more doctors in the system. It's still a lot. So, what I'm trying to explain here, that maybe the conventional medicine system of having the patient tra being traveling to the medical center is not the fitting thing for this kind of remote villages. Maybe there should be a new, um, new setting in place. Or more specifically, maybe the test that can be actually brought to the patient be, be much more helpful. Or more specifically, third time, point of care test might be the solution for these kind of situations. So what do I work on? I work in a program which is called iSense. It stands for Intelligent Sensing. It's a program in which we're developing point of care tests for infectious diseases for developing countries. We choose the infectious diseases depending on the need. And the way I like to describe my work is if it's a combination of three specific components. The first component is the disease. What is the application on which we're working? I specifically focus for, in this project on Ebola virus. Why is that? Because in 2014, once the World Health Organization announced the Ebola outbreak, the second next thing he announced is that there is a massive need for affordable, cheap, and portable diagnostic tests to be able to prevent people from moving around and transmitting the disease further, right? So we're working on Ebola. The second thing is the actual analytical tool. Where do we take the specimen from the patient and how do we analyze it? So I work with a technology which is called lateral flow tests. Um, you probably have all come across similar technologies. It's actually the same as a pregnancy test. It's super little, it's that small, it's very fast, and it's very cheap. And actually, it goes back to a lot of the topics of this, con of this, of this day. It's also based on nanotechnology. And the reason I'm working with this specific technology is because it's rapid. It takes less than 15 minutes to result. It's very cheap, it costs less than a dollar to manufacture, and it's portable, it's simple, it doesn't require electricity. The third component is the, is the connectivity and the readout. Because if someone is pregnant, it doesn't matter how pregnant she is, right? Pregnant, yes or no. <laughs> but if someone has an infectious disease, the quantification or the levels become really important for the patient management, in particular diseases like Ebola. So the test readout is done with a smartphone, and this is the cool thing. We use the smartphone to provide the test readout geographical tagging to be able to map and track people. And the third one is electronic archiving. So all the data can be potentially automatically shared in real time between either primary health centers or international organizations like WHO, which can improve the whole disease management. Once we have all the three components, we package them together and we need to check how well they work. So for that, we go on field and we do something which is called clinical validation or field studies. This is one example of, and this is actually my favorite part of the work because this is where you actually see where your technology is so useful and so cool. So this is a field work, um, field study we've done in Uganda. We've been following a cohort of, of Ebola survivals in Uganda because actually the survivals are also a really interesting population and really population in need for medication. So we've been following these um, survivals and we've been testing the levels of their immunity, how much antibodies they produce after being ill. And this you can see on the left side. What is super cool that out of one of our field studies, the outcome is the map that you can see on the right. This is one of the outcomes of our system. So you can see the map of Uganda in which you have little entry points which correspond to each person tested. The color of the point correspond whether it was positive, negative. The red one, you can see there is a spectrum. What's the level of positive and what's the level of negative? And if you touch on each point, you will get information like the age of the person, the sex, and so on and so forth. So it's super, super cool. So why are we using smartphones? Why are we not building some other random devices for this test? And the answer for it, well, it's a bit complex, but actually the answer is because there are so many smartphones in Africa. I don't know how many of you know that, but actually the GSMA predicts that by 2025 there will be a penetration of 90% mobile phones in sub-Saharan region. Over 60% of them will be smartphones, which is almost comparable to the developed world or to the Western world, which is great. And I think there are three main reasons for that, for why phones are so popular in these regions. 
The first one is because they provide basic services that people don't have in very remote villages. So for example, the concept of having a bank account or being able to reach your bank account is quite unusual because sometimes the distances are very far. Most people in remote villages don't even have a bank account. So what they do to manage their finances is using their mobile phone account for that. Smart, right? Super cool. The second thing is the actual price of smartphones, which are dropping massively. You can buy now a smartphone in Africa for $30, and it will be dropping more and more. So there is a massive opportunity over there. And the third one is the coverage, data coverage. It's expected that by the end of 2020, 3G will be covering most of African regions. So when we think again about this little village where Emil's family was living, they probably had 3G coverage, but they didn't have access to a hospital. So it will be a perfect target to be able to use mobile phones for mobile health, right? So with that, I'm going to slowly wrap up. This is a really nice photo. Um, I, well, I just like this photo. I'm going to leave that to you to decide if it's nice or not. Um, this photo was taken in a small region in South Africa, in a very rural area. And you can see on your right a health visitor sitting with a mobile device and interviewing a patient. It's in the middle of nowhere. There is no electricity there. There is a little mud hut that doesn't even have enough light to sit inside, so they sit outside but she can use a mobile phone to go through a medical process with the patient. And this is one of the targets of our systems. We're hoping that using, by using smartphones, we will be able to empower these countries that don't have the capacity of hospitals, laboratories, or very fancy training for personnel. Smartphones are easy to use. You don't need to have a lot of training. Also, the lateral flow and the deep sticks like pregnancy tests. So this combination of our products, we're hoping it will provide this preparedness to be able to provide in any kind of emergency, like an Ebola disease outbreak. With that, I really hope that if there will be another similar outbreak, or if we think about um, Emil and his family, if that technology was in place already back then, Maybe his family would have been diagnosed early enough, or maybe we didn't have to wait until 28,000 people over a course of two years were affected with Ebola virus. And with that, I thank you for your attention, and thank you.